On today's episode of the Horton Hustle Podcast, we're going to have a little conversation about differentiation. So you sitting at home, what in the blooming of Kentucky is differentiation? To the bow tie guy, to Mr. Horton, to James Horton, the, the concept of differentiation is nothing more than the teacher equipping the student with opportunities around their quote-unquote figurative belt, their, their tool belt, if you will, to give them opportunities to be successful in this world. Now, what am I talking about? Let me give you a little bit of an analogy that I like to think about. Think about someone that is, a, is working in construction. Now, a carpenter who works on the development of a new building, they're not going to just show up with no tool belt. You see what I'm saying? They're not being set up for success. They're going to have a tool belt that includes a hammer. They're going to have a measuring, uh, a, a measuring tool of some sort. They're going to have a flashlight. They're going to have nails that they can actually nail into the wood. They're going to have the hammer. They're going to have a wide variety of things, of, 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 of value that can help them accomplish their job. Now think about this in the classroom. As a teacher, are you employing, are you utilizing, are you entrusting, are you giving your students tools for their tool belt so they can be successful in your classroom? What am I talking about? There's a wide variety of differentiation uh, employments, uh, tasks, uh, strategies that your children, your students can employ in your classroom to be successful. One thing I like to talk about is Bloom's Taxonomy, and I love to introduce it. Now, I have not explicitly taught in a grade level lower than third grade, so I can't really speak for the pre-K, kindergarten, first, and second grade on how Bloom's Taxonomy may be uh, practical in the employment of, of a strategy of some sort. My wife could probably speak better to that as she's taught kindergarten and second grade for multiple years. But Bloom's Taxonomy is, is a wonderful opportunity for your students to ratchet up the rigor ratchet up their questioning techniques, ratchet up their, uh, their, 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 the method in which they answer questions, okay? Because you need to understand there's some basic questions, the who, what, when, where, why questions. And the why, you know, can lend itself to be quite a uh, prestigious, quite a, a high expectation, a, a high yield uh, questioning employment. But the more that the students create, they synthesize, they generate, they, um, they compare, they contrast. Those verbs right there in, in, in its own, th- that is causing them to think outside the box. That's HOTS, if you will. Higher order thinking skills. Students are reaching and, and you know they're getting to a place where they're starting to think outside the box. They're making connections with their previous experiences that they've experienced in their lives to things that they may have read text-to-self connections, uh, text-to-text connections, to text that they've read, and uh, text-to-world connections. And there's also this um, th- this theory about text-to-media. Uh, and so I love, I love seeing the connections that my students can make. And by utilizing the Bloom's Taxonomy, I can get my kids away from asking questions and just the verb of asking questions is a great employment to get kids not only engaged in what in the task that you're doing, uh, but also it's an anticipation guide. Think about the KWL. That, that really is just like a classroom um, contract, if you will, to keep people accountable and to keep the teacher accountable in the sense that you, know, you want to give your students opportunities to ask questions as well. Uh, because you want to you know, you extend the lesson outside of the black and white paper. Uh, the pencil paper, the, the standards that the state or district gives the teacher in order to determine whether or not their students are successful and achieving and all that. You you want to get you want to you don't want to devalue. You don't want to uh, get too far away from the relationship aspect of teaching. And so, getting your students involved, especially with Bloom's taxonomy, is a wonderful uh, a wonderful differentiation technique. Also, I want to talk about Robert Marzano. Now, if you know anything about Robert Marzano, he is a guru of educational research. Now, I love his research-based strategies. You have identifying similarities and differences. There's different effect sizes or expectations that someone could have from utilizing these strategies. And these yielding uh, experiences, these uh, strategies, if you will, will yield on a summative assessment. They, these, these will move the needle forward in the classroom, in a school, in a district. Um, and so, and I believe in these. Uh, and there was a good while where I spent a lot of my time focusing on one of my favorites, one of the highest yielding strategies, identifying similarities and differences. Lord have mercy, we would spend time sorting just about everything. Because in my opinion, everything could be put 
everything could be cut and pasted and sorted and manipulated into understanding. And, and I just fell in love with that. Summarizing and note taking, typically later elementary school into middle school and high school, you see a lot more note taking, but here's what here's the trend that I'm seeing that students aren't, they're not really prepared to understand why they're they're taking notes why they're summarizing but you know just the the act the verb the process of summarizing that is a great strategy in breaking down massive amounts of information into chunks chunks that they own chunks that they can use in their own lives and and is that not what learning is it's taking something from a bigger pot into your own life and making that connection and applying it okay next reinforcing effort and providing recognition you know, when's the last time that you spent time actually, you know, giving recognition? And I'm not just talking about that cheesy praise. Good job. No, no. I'm talking about specific uh, praise for the amount of effort. Um, I love that my kids would utilize that Bloom's taxonomy and I could tell that they are employing a higher ratcheted rigor verb, uh, if you will, uh, in questioning something in the classroom. If they made a connection, if they're comparing and contrasting, I specifically provide them praise for employing that strategy that is in their tool belts. Now, homework and practice. You gotta think, there's a lot of research that kind of goes both ways. Homework has to be effective, it has to be practical, it has to be short in the sense that kids don't need to discount their family time. They don't need to discount the whole aspect of being a kid, a child, not an adult. Trust me, there's plenty of time to be an adult <laughs> and, and we all know what that's what that's like, paying bills, etc. But they need time to, to be a kid. So homework should not take up their entire afternoon and it shouldn't be a cause of stress in the household as well. Now, I believe in practice and repeti- uh, repetition, but almost it needs to be kind of a contract, kind of a conversation. It's formative in nature where you kind of need to gather. Uh, it's a great opportunity for you to give out surveys to, uh, to kind of get a gauge of your family, uh, your families, your stakeholders, to see what their expectations are with homework, to see what your students' expectations are with homework. And perhaps maybe if it's not explicitly written, perhaps maybe it's a conversation you have with other faculty members and administration members. What is homework? What, why do we give homework? Because you don't need to do it for no reason. You don't need to do it because it's something that you were given as a student. Now, homework needs to be essential. It needs to be practical. It needs to have a connection to precisely what you're doing in the classroom. And it most assuredly doesn't need to be busy work as well. Also, cooperative learning. One of my favorite types of learning mechanisms and strategies in the classroom is reciprocal learning. And I'm not talking about putting your gifted child with a struggling child. No, I love seeing my students become teachers. Become teachers in the, the aspect that they, ha- they have to summarize. They have to chunk. They have to do what you do as a teacher every single day. They have to uh, re-deliver, to break down, to synthesize information. And, and what's, what's great is, you know who's great at, at, at taking information and putting it in kid-friendly terms? The kids, the students. So why not give them opportunities to have more think-pair-share time, to have more time where they're doing the, the hustle. They're doing the work. You know, and I've always heard this theory that if teachers go home tired, then there's something wrong with that. Then they're doing it wrong. I'm not sure if I necessarily subscribe to that, but I will tell you that I think that students need an opportunity to to hustle. They don't need to be sitting and getting. They need to be uh, engaged and operating in the classroom. So cooperative learning is an awesome strategy to utilize. Also, setting objectives and providing feedback. You want to be very careful of not a not um, violating FERPA, which what's sad is for a long time people didn't understand this, but by putting feedback and glows and grows specifically to student work in a hallway where their student where the student's name is written explicitly at the top of the page, that's a violation of FERPA. It's no one's business how what you think about that student's performance or their progress or their need. For improvement. No, that stuff needs to be kept in house. Um, y- if you put anything out in the hallway, it needs to be kind of generic. Cover up the kid's name because, look, there's a lot of people who walk up and down the hallways, and that student's progress needs to be protected in a shroud of confidentiality. Also, I want you to remember that questioning and keeping those advanced organizers, the KWL chart, the anticipation guide, that is a great opportunity to get your kids engaged 
and to develop that relationship that is so critical for your students. This is James Horton, Mr. Horton, Bowtie Guy. This is part one of, I guess, a longer series of differentiation. Today we talked about levels of blooms and Marzano's research-based strategies. Hopefully on the next time, we'll talk about the process of differentiation and accommodations that are very simple employments that can be documented as differentiation in your classroom. We'll see you next time. This is Mr. Horton, James Horton, Bowtie Guy, and we're out. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.